I'm seeing really excellent examples of um, in in the project developer community, and I'm I'm looking at, at Mark from Tanzania, uh, Carbon Tanzania, in the audience, and there are others as well. Is actually bringing uh, making real investment into the community representatives, supporting them to be the representatives for the projects themselves, really investing in the communications capacity um, of, of um, project representatives that can, can speak with authority around the impact the projects are having in their own communities. We might be very busy developing projects all the time, we might be on the ground, we might think we can represent those communities, but actually it's far better coming from them. That is um, much more authentic, um, and I think we need to see a lot more of that. Okay, thanks. We did open the door there to tech. So, John, um, can I turn to you and yes. get some thoughts on how tech can play into the question, not just on what we've been talking about, but more widely demonstrating quality on an ongoing basis? Sure, yes. Um, thanks, Andrew, and, and thank you uh, to the audience. So, I'm John Pierre, the um, CEO of Manta Labs, and via our GeoTree platform, we provide assessments and monitoring for nature based carbon pro projects across forestry and agriculture. So I think um, just to kind of lean on what was you know, just discussed, um, you know, the tech really goes beyond just the, the verification and the monitoring as well from our perspective. I think it's a really exciting time to be able to you know, try and look at the, the real causes as Zoe kind of touched on in terms of why deforestation is taking place. And I think that's where you know, we go beyond just saying you know, monitoring deforestation, but what kind of tools can we give some of the, the local communities to try and really deal with things such as leakage as well, and some of the key drivers. A great example is things like agronomic advice. Can we assist smallholder farmers, for example, in terms of sustainable intensification of their, um, their fields, so we don't have to encroach on the forest? Other areas that we've looked at with, with um, clients such as Amazon who are looking at different reforestation projects, or how can we bring in crop insurance? And in this sense, you know, we don't have to rely on some of the uh, developed market mechanisms to give um, smallholder farmers insurance, but we can also use things like parametric insurance using satellite data, for example, and that in itself can be another kind of capacity building, um, I think, mechanism that hopefully can be part of a, you know, a broader suite of solutions. So that's why I think, you know, when, you know, typically when people think about, you know, technology when it comes to, um, you know, the carbon markets, we're very focused on, oh yeah, MRV and satellite data and, and everything else. And, you know, to be honest, I missed the, the panel earlier today. I suspect there was probably a lot of focus on that, um, you know, but I think, you know, in terms of, you know, going a bit beforehand, I mean, before we get to the monitoring, there's a lot of things that we need to understand locally. And if we are not going to tackle some of the key drivers, if we aren't going to allow, for example, the local communities, the smallholder farmers, you know, have a, a better livelihood where they don't have to do these, these practices in the first place. Similarly, when it comes to commercial agriculture, right? Um, and agriculture, obviously, you know, whether it's smallholder or large commercial agriculture, you know, definitely accounts for probably 90%, if not more, of, lo of, of, of global deforestation. And I think, you know, we need to see how can we actually balance all these things, right? Because equally, we're going to have to try and uh, support nine and a half billion people in the, in the coming decades. So it's no point us saying, okay, we're gonna just monitor, well, we're not actually dealing with the root causes of some of the issues we're talking about on the ground. Thank you. That was really interesting about the insurance point, so technology solutions to kind of reduce the cost of wider solutions. Um, Martin, can I bring you in? Um, and just your perspective on clearly what you're looking for as a fund manager, but also, can get you to touch on how you would like to see transparent information flows to support a fund with multiple different projects. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. Good afternoon. So, Martin Burke, I'm the CEO of Climate Asset Management. We are managing different investment vehicles um, in and around natural capital. One of one of our funds is a nature, it's a nature-based carbon fund, so we're managing on behalf of our clients funding for new forward-looking investments um, in, in voluntary carbon market projects. So we are um, we're only focused on nature, so the majority of what we're doing is actually probably at the moment more in restoration, but we also, are, a lot of our investors, 
constantly remind us that conservation is, is, is just very important as well, and, and they want to support it. Um, maybe so, I'm, I'm sure we're talking in a minute a little bit about kind of more the technical issues, because I think that's one of the biggest concerns, of course, um, of investors at the moment when it comes to Red Plus. It's like, okay, how can we develop a sound um, baseline? But I, we wanted to talk beyond kind of the, the baselines, I'm, but I'm sure we're getting into that. So. I think when, when it comes to, to Red Plus, it doesn't actually matter whether it's a Red Plus project or whether it's another a nature-related project. The, the question what cons constitutes um, quality is almost the same, and I thought so you outlined it actually very well, so I took my notes here, and, 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 and it sounded very much like what we are also being asked to, um, to present. Maybe I can just highlight on a, on a few things that, that, we, that we find particularly important. So I think we have not to forget these are voluntary market transactions, and the investors that want to do that want to go beyond just a simply quantification of the emission reduction that they can use for their net zero target. They have different things they want to achieve. And, and so the <clears throat> achieving, I would still call it co-benefits, cool but achieving um, additional benefits is, is very important um, for these investors. But I think it starts usually, really, uh, quality really starts with the stakeholder engagement. And I think we would 100% agree with, with what you said, Zoe, that um, making sure that stakeholders are both um, engaged. Firstly, I think we have to we have to define who are actually the stakeholders, and I think you mentioned also land title and um, in, in in general land ownership. That's probably one of the, the biggest challenges, in particular when it comes to very large Red Plus project, but any other forestry project as well. How can we actually demonstrate that there is land title, in particular when there are local communities that are clearly living on that but may not have it properly documented? And I think Andrew. We worked with you, right, already, when was it, 2008, nine on our first kind of Red Plus project, where that was also the biggest issue. And I think it hasn't, even, even, even though we're involved in many other things, I think that on that part, we haven't really involved as much. It's a, it's a huge challenge to establish that, especially if you're going into the project that we should do, which are involving smallholders, right? So when it's not just, the easiest Red Plus is there's one landholder that can control everything and can document it, but actually the most impactful are the ones where, where, where you work with, with lots of smaller um, landholders. But that, that creates immediately the challenges. So second step, the stakeholder engagement is, is, is very important. The benefit sharing, I agree, it has to be transparent. I think what we find as well, it's not only that we document and report later on in the benefit sharing, but actually the most important thing for us is how that, what actually happens with the money afterwards and how is that being distributed and the governance around that, the decision making of local communities, um, because in, in some instances this is a significant sums of money in communities that actually in some instances have almost no cash, other other cash payments that they're receiving, so it's something very new for them. So I think that's that's on the one hand side, like organising this in the right way is, is is one of the kind of the the, the, key, the key quality indicators. And then I, um, for for us, given that we're focusing so much on on natural capital, the um, the, the one big piece is also going going beyond just the, the, the climate account and the biodiversity is very important for us as well. And I think it's um, it's always easy said that yeah, there is a lot of things we're doing that increases biodiversity. I think for us it's very important that it's measurable and that we can actually quantify it in the way. So the tech in the long term will play some some role of it. I think in, in the beginning at the moment we're seeing a lot of it is actually done manually. We've just done some wasn't a Red Plus project, but it was a rotation glass and project. We just done some of the first biodiversity survey. This is all done manually, right? People are standing there, listening to birds or, 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 and, and, and making notes. So I think we're still a bit far away that the tech can play that role, but we, we hope, hope it will. But I think the important part is that you, can, that you can actually baseline and measure it and then quantify it. And I think increasingly the investors are saying it's no longer enough that you show me a nice picture of some um, animals or something else that you're, that you're preserving. I actually want to see hard numbers. I want to I want to understand how you how you collected that. So maybe maybe I stop here for the moment. No, no, it's very interesting. I, I remember working on a project where the investor did say, "This PDD has got some amazing stuff about biodiversity. So how are you going to report on that?" And the developer was just. It became clear it was just pretty pictures. In a way. Not not in that was sense that was false at all, but they realised quite quickly that they had no means of tracking that. Yeah, and, and that's that's a big problem. Right? So and I think all all the impact side. I don't think that. It's not the case that the impacts are not there, and I think, especially some, for some developers, especially the very local ones, it's obvious that there's impact. I mean, we've seen this, and but it's not enough for somebody who sits maybe 5,000 kilometers away to kind of to to to, to grasp that, and, and they want to see well, I want to see hard evidence of that, and not no longer just you, I trust you kind of thing. And so it is, it is. I think that is that is a challenge, and as I said, I think the tech um, solutions will play a huge role there to to demonstrate that. There was a very interesting session earlier today where. There was some comfort that the tech is getting there, that there are solutions and 
think one of the messages someone gave was, let's not be fearful, let's get on with it, because there, it, 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 there's enough to be confident. Anyway, going off, tr off track. Best to last, Vera. What's Vera got to say, Naomi, about, well, you're going to touch on baselines as well, but more on what standard is doing around some of these other hallmarks of quality. Um, and I'm going to, I'm sure you've got some things to say, but I'd also like you to think about, um, but I'll have a follow-up. You, you go first. Great. Thanks. Uh, Naomi Swigward with Vera. Uh, we're the largest standard in the voluntary carbon market. Um, before I dive into what we're doing on uh, systematically within Vera, I also just want to mention that I think this panel is really focusing on the supply side of quality. And I don't think we can forget that there is also a problem of demand side quality. Uh, and what I mean by that is that, you know, there's been a lot of focus on the preciseness of baselines on the supply side, and yet the footprint of corporates remains highly uncertain. So we do need to think about uh, quality all the way from the ultimate demand uh, back through the chain. So I'm not going to go into that now, but I just wanted to highlight it briefly. I think what we're hearing in this panel is that much of what defines quality really comes down to project design. It comes down to how you implement rules and not just the rules and requirements themselves. Um, and so there are, uh, you know, we need to make sure that the strategies and the data that is used in these projects is appropriate to the local context in the place in which it exists. And obviously standards uh, play a role, but it's not just about those rules then, it's about how we actually implement them and the processes and procedures for ensuring that those design elements uh, and those data um, are used appropriately uh, in the system. So I want to talk a bit about what Vera is doing on the systems front. I think we spend a lot of time on these panels talking about baselines. Maybe the only thing I'm going to say is that the new methodology for avoided unplanned deforestation should be out by COP. Uh, <laughs> which has been a, a rolling effort um, with the auditors to get everything signed off, but it is coming very soon. Um, so what are we doing? Uh, I want to talk about three areas. So digitization and transparency, uh, DMRV and auditing, and the sustainable development and FPIC side of things. And I'm talking about Vera, but I think the other standards are, are working on similar things, and I think we're going to see similar uh, efforts and, and pressure for these kinds of updates uh, within uh, Article 6.4 as well. So on the digitization uh, and transparency side of things, so Vera has been working for the last couple of years on an innovative project hub. Uh, so I know all of you uh, are constantly annoyed by having to follow up with Vera staff about, where is my project? How come you haven't responded to my email? Um, so one of the key things we're doing is digitizing the process and creating a hub where you'll be able to look at the status of your project at any given moment. Uh, and it'll also allow for um, data submission and, and tracking uh, and location of, uh, of efforts within that tool. We're also working on digitizing the, basically the entire system. So all of the methodologies, uh, the non-permanence risk tool, uh, all of these will be within a system where the data is input uh, in rather than in a manual PDF, um, uh, which is both about efficiency, but it's also very much about transparency. So a lot of you have tried to analyze this market in different ways, and you find it incredibly frustrating because everything is embedded in PDFs on a system, and it's really hard to access. So we're looking at trying to make that data all much more accessible uh, and fluid. One of the other key elements that we're working on uh, on the digitizing front is, is a new system of long-term permanence management. So we have a requirement for long-term monitoring of these projects to ensure permanence. Uh, but um, if a project ceases to exist, there's been an assumption that you just have lost that carbon and it gets canceled from the buffer pool. <laughs> so to strengthen both the monitoring and to strengthen uh, the permanence management over time, we are using and leveraging a lot of what is now possible from remote sensing monitoring to create a system where we're actually directly monitoring those, proje uh, those projects from a centralized system, such that we'll be able to cancel credits if it's lost in the, on the ground as it's happening. Uh, so all of these together are trying to create a system that is more efficient uh, and that has a, a much greater level of transparency. Uh, we're also looking at much more innovation within the system. So when we're talking about uh, DMRV uh, and auditing, you know, how can we incorporate some of the latest technology into the methodologies and into the process, uh, again, to ensure transparency and to control um, and the scaling of this market, doing things more efficiently. 
We started about a year ago um, a, a DMRV pilot system uh, where we got about 70 different applications of those who were looking to test new ways of digitally monitoring uh, projects uh, and have incorporated that into a set of pilots that are ongoing. Um, and we are also looking at establishing a new technology working group uh, that will bring in some of the innovative players in this space to help create a dialogue around the methodologies that we're developing and the realm of the possible uh, from a technology standpoint to better be able to articulate uh, forward movement on this and incorporate those technologies into our tools. So that'll do things like looking at uh, you know, how can we facilitate the direct measurement of above ground biomass uh, rather than uh, you know, activity data and emission factors. Uh, so for more precise, more accurate, more uh, frequently measured uh, results within projects over time. That also relates back then to auditing. And I think we're likely to see a real revolution in how auditing is done over the next few years. You know, to date, it has been an incredibly manual process. Uh, a lot of time spent on the ground double checking field plots. And that is important. But a lot of the time that auditors spend is making sure that the documents don't have typos in the equations uh, and things like that. So digitizing that entire process and also potentially leveraging uh, other systems, you know, other remote sensing platforms to compare to the data in the project that helps identify where there are anomalies in the data. What that might do is provide a much more efficient way to audit these projects that then focuses the, f the human audit time on really looking and questioning the assumptions behind the data that's used in a project instead of, uh, of spending it uh, long term. Uh, looking at the details that will now be digitized and can be uh, spotted from a machine perspective very rapidly. But auditing is, uh, maybe to bring me to the final point, uh, something that when we think about the social side is still going to have to be very human driven. And I think it's an area where there is a huge amount of improvement still needed in terms of defining how we better measure uh, the impact on uh, local communities and on all of these benefits that are a core part of the success of a project, um, and, and how we ensure that there's better guidance for ongoing FPIC uh, and making sure that in the audit process, it is actually being assessed uh, that, that that ongoing communication and engagement and, and consent of communities is really built in and continued over time. So we're looking at at options for improving those things. We've taken some steps to clarify within version VCS version 4.5, which just came out. We'll be looking at some more of that in version five. Uh, but this is an, an evolving area uh, that I think we all need to be considering. You know, at the end of the day, as, as Zoe was saying, you know, that quality really comes down to how we design strategies and those strategies must be based on the humans that are present. So we need to be making sure that that is built in to the entire system. Sorry for the laundry list. But those are lots of things that we're working on that we, I think, often don't talk about and are really important to the long-term uh, quality approach within the market. So thank you. Thank you. All right, very silly question. Can I just ask the organizers, how long have we got left? No, they're chatting. We'll keep going then until they stop us. <laughs> um, can I have a quick follow-up? And then others might want to jump in as well. Um, everyone likes kicking the voluntary market, but when I listen to that, I think voluntary market remains. There you go, 10 minutes. <laughs> Be quick, so I'm sure there's a bunch of questions. Martin and I haven't talked about this. Everyone seems to think that corresponding adjustments in Article 6 or Article 5 equals quality, and therefore we don't have to worry because once we all move to that world, everything is solved, which it's just not true. And so it, it sounds to me like Voluntary standards have a lot to teach us about getting to scale and doing it in a way that still ensures quality. Would you agree, or what are the challenges to getting to scale through that? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good point, right? I mean, uh, Article 5, if we're talking about RED, uh, you know, was designed for um, results-based finance. It wasn't specifically written for market mechanisms. And so Article 6 doesn't make reference nor does it make reference? I think the, the general understanding is that it could function within Article 6. Certainly it can within 6.2. Um, but we don't really have uh, any kind of articulated methodological level requirements for RED there. And I think we're starting to see some issues come out over some of the, um, I don't really want to call them standards, <laughs> uh, but uh, approaches of, of trading uh, within that 
that sector. And I think much of the scrutiny that we see on this market will be coming uh, there as well. And there's a lot less detail on paper for how to do it credibly. Um, Article 6 is going to face all of these same issues. Uh, and I think you know, Vera has re recently released a number of new methodologies. For example, two days ago, our new ARR methodology was posted, finally. Um, and it, we did that because we felt that there were problems with the CDM AR methodologies that had been previously uh, usable under, under the VCS. So Article 6.4 has a ton of work to do still on setting out the new sort of versions of methodologies that will be eligible. And they will be dealing with all of these same issues in terms of how do they better leverage technology? How do they update their systems? Uh, you know, CDM was all very manual, the same way that the, stand the carbon standards have been. So this evolution needs to happen across the markets. And I don't think that, you know, Article 6, Article 5, they have no magic bullets in terms of integrity, except for the fact that it is aligned with national accounting, which our new approach takes as well. Well, the panel wants to come in, but if you've ever watched the supervisory board meetings, you know that they've got a lot of work to do to get, <laughs> get there. But can I just say, I think the new AR methodology that um, Naomi mentions, that's a great example of how potentially you can use a standard and a methodology to hopefully change the market because, you know, we've been very close to the Abacus group, that, which is led by Amazon, I believe, which has been working on that methodology. It has things like dynamic baselines, right? Matching your project area to control points elsewhere using things like remote sensing. Um, and I think that's going to be a game changer, really, potentially for the market going forward. And I think with the, the whole new consolidated JNR methodologies, hopefully we still see the evolution as well in the market. We, I think we're kind of you know, happy to be a deforestation data provider and working with Vera, for example, on the Peruvian frails. And I think we still obviously have potentially some improvement when it comes to risk maps, for example, and other components. But at least it's, it's very clear the direction of travel here. I think we are evolving overall as a market. Baselines are one component. Obviously, the whole point of this session is beyond baselines and things like leakage, I think, should be getting a lot more attention. We're working with Cambridge University on seeing how we can minimize leakage by design really targeting some of those drivers I mentioned in terms of deforestation to make sure that actors are, no, are not just moving from one location to elsewhere, and also th tackling things like you know, non-permanence and other issues we have in the carbon market. So I think we're seeing that you know, we're tackling from different angles. The methodologies and the, the standards obviously have one role to play. Technology has another role to play, and I think um, you know, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's exciting to see. You know, just I mean, going back to the Arctic 6, I would fully agree. I mean, we had, I say two things. One is we had the experience already with the JI mechanism, which despite what we're saying, that's really what Article 6 is, or at least 6.2. Um, and we've seen back then that the quality varied significantly. Ultimately, I think the, the buyer of that, which will be ultimately government, whether it's 6.2 or 6.4, it's a, it's a government that buys this in the end, indirectly or directly, they set the quality standard. And, and I think, Article 6 will have to be judged by that. 6.4 will have some involvement of the supervisory coming, yes, and some methodology, but ultimately it is the, the end buyer that says, okay, I'm happy to, to, to basically for, for that to say, I'm, I'm, I'm making this up and that I'm paying for that. So, so and, and, and that, yeah, so we fully agree with your assessment. It doesn't mean by any means quality. Um, it can, but it is no, it is no insurance that there's any higher quality by using Article 6. Running out of time. Questions? Anyone? Got one up the back. Hi, Jos Lemons. Like I said yesterday, I'm a consultant. But um, my question is 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 about it harks back a little bit to what Naomi said on on quality of the buy side. Right? Um, do you already see that? The CSRD has has is, is, is making inroads is in, in in what clients ask and what they need they need to report and and that that comes back to you uh, or to you to 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 yeah, to, to the product developers um, in in terms of what they need to know do you already see that anyone yeah maybe maybe for the technology guy. <laughs> that would be John Pierre. <laughs> I, I think Martin is probably best place to talk about demand. Could you? I have to say, I did not fully understand 
from from what angle you were, you were you were coming from is it the question whether the 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 quality is already required or well well yeah I, I mean if 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 the regulator requires more information from the investors they will need to get their information from 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 the project developers or maybe from you right do you see already that because it's all very new do you see already that that is happening well, I mean, you definitely see the scrutiny is increasing and the information needs are increasing, but I don't think that any, to us at least, nobody came now and said exactly for this specific or that specific regulation, I, I see that. I would also say that a lot of the, the corporates are still, um, well, the, A, they are, they are regulated in different jurisdictions, and, and, and B, they're getting quite a few of um, potential future demands, but very little concrete regulation at the moment, and so the interpretation is also quite different. Um, depending on depending on the corporate so but you definitely see I mean that's what's where we're coming from I'm mean, on the on the baselines um, they, they want to see ideally measured measured baselines on any additional impact you can't just say any longer I'm producing impact you have to be able to prove it and you have to be able to quantify it I guess this this is all coming from 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 from, from kind of from all the same sides right that that Corporates are also getting these pressures and saying, so how can you say that, that, that you're actually having these additional impacts? Or how can you say that you achieve a certain number of emission rates? So that's definitely, that's definitely there. But I, I don't think it's one specific regulation that is driving this at the moment. Can, can I just, just, just on the question though, I think, you know, and I, I guess it's tied, we are seeing an evolution in the market where the corporates are becoming more active upstream. So I think tied to that question, you know, typically we wouldn't expect our client base to be corporates. You know, we think that project developers or fund of the project, project development might be our clients, but now we're seeing corporates, you know, getting involved, trying to get equity funding into projects early on, and therefore, yes, they want to, you know, work with tech providers, with off-takers, with other market participants. So I think we're seeing that kind of compression in a way, and hopefully that's one of the keys to scaling the market going forward as well. Can I just jump in? I think it's also defensive for some of the corporates, you know, that keep talking about like we can get to a world of constant verification through satellites. But, but why I kept asking about it is I think some clients want to understand what is going on in that project when it comes to benefit sharing, when it comes to safeguards today or last month or the last six months and not have it audited on a two yearly basis or whatever, what have you. And, and that might be driven by I just want quality, but it's also driven by I don't want to end up in a Guardian article with someone saying something about a project I bought credits from when I don't know what's going on and I don't know how to find out the answer quickly. So I think, I think the extent to which we can have systems that provide robust information about real tough stuff like does the community trust actually put out the money that it said it was going to? Are people happy? What's the latest stats on grievances? We, we kind of need that. But you know, it's, I, it's, I would say it's also risk management. So I think the, the, all these questions on quality are on the one hand side asked because many corporates do this for, for you know, also for communication and all these things and they want to do the right thing. But I think for many of them it's also a risk management tool because you don't have a proper benefit sharing um, scheme. You actually expose yourself to a lot of risk. The same if you don't organize how, how, how benefits are being distributed. Again, you're very exposed to, 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 to that something's wrong and ultimately it comes back to the, um, to the buy of the carbon credit. And I think that's that's becoming very clear to many corporates now. Yeah, I might just add that I think this is an area where there is a need for a lot more innovation that really hasn't happened yet. You know, we've focused on remote sensing and satellite data, but that does not help us on the community front. You know, so what does that look like? Is it apps where communities can be surveyed or is it, you know, digitized grievance mechanisms? What does that actually look like? Or what's a functional option for having better real-time data on the social side? Good question. Yeah, and, and I would just add that um, I think it is reflection that all of this is needed, can completely understand why from the demand side there's anxiety and there's a need and a desire for as much transparency as possible. I think just to bear in, bear in mind that, that doing this work is incredibly demanding, that it takes huge amounts of resource and effort. It's expensive. The more you ask for, the more it's going to cost. So I think we need... We certainly need technical innovation to help us do things more efficiently, more cost-effectively, more quickly. Um, but we also know that some things can't be digitized. We know that human processes can't be accelerated unnaturally. Um, so 
there are trade-offs, and if 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 the finance comes in to match the cost of doing it, I think we can get there. But it's a challenge day to day getting projects developed, and I think that needs to be borne in mind too. If we want quality, we have to pay for it. Yeah. Okay. Good. We're at time. Thank you very much. Fantastic.